This is the new Garmin VivoActive 5, a bit of a surprise announcement for a model that hasn't seen an update in over four years. But here it is, not only with a new display, but an absolute boatload of new features. Both myself and my wife have been putting these watches through their paces over the last few weeks, including multi-hour rides, runs, swims, and plenty more. In this video, I'm gonna take you through all those new features and tell you what works well and, and what needs a little bit of love. With that, let's just dive straight into it with the pricing. The VivoActive 5 is 299 US dollars and it comes in one size. That's 150 bucks cheaper than the also brand new Garmin Venue 3 they just announced a few weeks ago that comes in at 449 in two different sizes, a small and a larger size. So the very first thing you're probably noticing is this new AMOLED display, this bright colorful display there. Uh, this is a 1.2 inch AMOLED display, the same size as on the smaller edition of the Venue 3, the Venue 3S. Uh, and this is a departure from the past VivoActive series having a mid based display. Now the main difference between those two types of displays tends to be the brilliance of the display. You see it's very, very colorful here. As I swipe through these two watches, mine and uh, my wife's, uh, you can see it's just a very colorful overall feel compared to a mid-base display being a little more dull. Now, historically speaking, AMOLED displays have been favored in darker conditions and mid-base displays favored in brighter sunny conditions. But that isn't really true with AMOLED displays of the last year or two. Uh, these days, an AMOLED display is totally fine in bright sunny conditions. And that's been the case in my testing as well. This past weekend, it was bright and sunny out. Uh, no problem seeing the screen, either in workouts or just day-to-day -day usage. And then today in the middle of this stormy weather outside where it's really dark and overcast, swimming in basically like puke colored water, no problem seeing the display either. Like it works great in both of those scenarios. Uh, my wife has said the same thing as well. Now there's effectively two different modes for AMOLED displays. And this is true of pretty much all watches out there in this category. Uh, the first is an always on display. And that's what you see on the blue watch here, the one I've been primarily wearing. And if you look really closely, you'll see the display is always on, even my wrist, but it's in a dim state right now. As I raise my wrist up like this, it'll go to full brightness like you can see right there. Versus my wife's watch over here, it's off. The display is in an off state until I raise my wrist. Once I raise my wrist, then it turns on to full brightness. Uh, in this mode, you'll get a longer battery life. So looking at that battery life, you're gonna get up to 11 days in the uh, gesture based, like my wife's watch is right now. Uh, that's basically smartwatch mode versus the always on mode over here, it's gonna be five days. I'd say that's in the ballpark of what we're getting. In my case, I've been doing about 60 to 90 minutes or so of workouts per day, uh, some with GPS, some without GPS, and I'm having to charge it about every like four-ish days uh, because obviously GPS time pulls down from the smartwatch numbers. In my wife's case, She's been doing like crazy four, five hour workouts every day. And frankly, neither I nor she can keep track of how many times she's had to charge this thing. This really isn't the watch for that kind of stuff, to be honest. Uh, she's primarily using a Phoenix for her normal workouts, but she's been happy to take this out on all of her workouts and get a bunch of test data uh, for the GPS and heart rate sections a little bit later on in this video. And hey, just a quick note, if you are finding this video interesting or useful, if you could just whack that like button or hit subscribe, it really does help with this video and the channel quite a bit. Now, one of the first new features you're gonna notice is the new sleep metrics. So let's just dive through some of those really quickly. Swiping down through here in the widgets, we're gonna go down into the sleep section. Uh, and you see there's the sleep score right there. That's all the same as in the past. You can tap this open and you can look at your sleep duration, the sleep phases, stages, and so on. From a sleep accuracy standpoint, I kind of look at two things. Did it get the time I went to sleep correctly and the time I woke up and then the total duration of sleep? I had one night where it didn't quite line up compared to all of the devices I had, but most nights it lined up just fine. The next bit is these sleep stages and sleep phases. That's not something I tend to evaluate. And the reason why is the technology to compare this against the so-called gold standard is only like an 80%-ish accuracy range, which isn't all that accurate to be honest compared to other things we can measure around heart rate and GPS and stuff like that. So uh, I wouldn't bother measuring the accuracy of this and I wouldn't bother focusing on these stages either. Uh, instead, just focus on getting sleep. That tends to be sort of the best thing. Uh, and that's really what Garmin's trying to do here as well. If I go up to the new feature called Sleep Coach right there, uh, you can see it's recommending nine hours tonight. And the way it works is it starts off with this personal baseline. Uh, so if I tap this right here, my personal baseline is seven hours and 50 minutes. Uh, now the word personal, I think Garmin's probably pushing that a little bit here uh, because personal in this case simply means all 35 to 49 year olds starts off with a baseline of seven hours and 50 minutes. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't call that personal at all. Uh, and then from there, it either adds or reduces sleep to keep you between seven hours and nine hours of sleep. Meaning you'll never recommend less than seven hours and never recommend more than nine hours. Uh, and if we go back here, we can swipe down, we can see the factors that influence this. Sleep history, activity history, HRV, and nap. 
Uh, and that gets one of the other new features, which is the nap feature. Uh, this is something Garmin introduced on the Venue 3 a couple weeks ago, and now we're seeing it here as well. If I take a nap today, I could tap this nap option right here, like you're seeing on the screen, and see details about that nap. Additionally, I can also go into the body battery area and see details about the nap there as well and how it contributes and impacts the body battery throughout the day. Uh, and my testing both in the Venue 3 as well as here, as well as my wife's testing of the nap feature, she's a fan of the nap feature, uh, I've had no problems with it. It actually generally gets it within a couple minutes uh, of the nap itself and will also give you guidance on whether or not the nap was too long or too short or whatever the case may be. So kudos on the nap side and so-so uh, on the sleep coach side. The other new feature in the sleep kind of realm is HRV status. We've seen Garmin introduce this on a number of the wearables over the past year, and now we're seeing it on the Vivo Active series as well. Uh, this will track your heart rate variability at night, and HRV, your heart rate variability, is, is basically a metric of the time in between your heartbeats, uh, and essentially the lower it is, the worse it is, and the higher it is, the better it is. But there's some variance even with that. If you go too high, it's not so good, but setting all that aside for right now, uh, you can see basically it establishes the baseline. This is your personal baseline. In this case, Garmin is using the term personal correctly. Uh, it takes my data over the course of 19 nights as my initial baseline, gives me these new color coding, as well as the past 90 days as well worth of data. Uh, so if I swipe up here, you can see my HRV status last night. I uh, started off pretty low and slowly increased over the course of the night. Keep in mind things like alcohol and stress and, and basically everything will impact this number. Uh, and if I swipe down again, you see my seven day average. Uh, I am missing one like data point in there because I took a red eye flight back from San Francisco to here. And I only slept about two hours on that flight. So not quite long enough to trigger this uh, to capture that data. I believe you need about four hours of time to get that HRV data uh, to trigger in there. Now, one of the things that's worthwhile noting is if you flip this over, you're gonna see a newer optical heart rate sensor than the Vivo Active 4. This is Garmin's V4 uh, Elevate Optical Heart Rate Sensor, or Gen 4 Elevate Optical Heart Rate Sensor, uh, but it's not their newest optical heart rate sensor. That's their V5 or Gen 5 series that came out this past summer uh, and has been pretty much on all their other watches except this. For whatever reason, this watch didn't make the cut and it got the V4 version. That's not a huge deal in the grand scheme of things. This is generally a very accurate optical heart rate sensor, but it does mean this unit will not get one feature, which is ECG. Uh, so there's no electrocardiogram support on the Vivo Active 5, and it will never have that either because it lacks the hardware internally to pull that off. So if you do want ECG support, don't buy this watch, buy something else. On the bright side, you do get a different new software feature instead, which is the morning report. Each morning when you wake up, you're going to see this report, the very first thing you'll see uh, when you raise your wrist in the morning, and it basically shows you the weather for the day, and as you swipe down, uh, it shows you additional stats, so your sleep time, your HRV time, uh, any calendar appointments, and so on, uh, and these are all customizable, and you can turn this off if you want to as well, though pretty much everyone seems to love this feature, so I'm not sure you'll probably turn this off. Uh, it's really super handy, and it's really well executed. Uh, the raindrops on the screen right there match the fact that it was dumping outside, uh, and then when it was sunny out, it matched the fact it was sunny and cloudy and so on. Like they've spent a lot of time on this. It's pretty impressive. Next, there's a number of new sport features in the Vivo Active 5. I'll put them on the screen, the bottom of the screen right there. Uh, probably one of the most notable ones for me anyways uh, is the open water swim feature. You can see the purple watch on my wife's wrist there in between the wave breaks. Uh, keep in mind, when you're in the swimming modes, it'll disable that touch screen entirely. So you don't have to worry about like water droplets and doing wonky thing. There's also the new hand cycle sport profiles as well. Really like a first in the industry. Again, something introduced on the Venue 3. Uh, and that's by the way, the general theme here is that this watch is simply just a mini Venue 3, both physically uh, as well as like spec wise and price wise and everything like that. Uh, it's something I'll touch on a little bit later on in the review and I talk about kind of where this all fits into things. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that there are a number of features in the sporting realm that have been removed or otherwise like cut down quite a bit compared to the Vivo Active 4 in the past. Uh, the first thing to note is there's no barometric altimeter on this watch. Uh, there was on the Vivo Active 4, there it is on the Venue 3, but there's not on the Vivo Active 5. That has some downstream impacts. Uh, number one, there's no floors climb metric, so if you're going upstairs and things like that, that will not track that anymore. Uh, number two, there's no automated downhill skiing or downhill snowboarding uh, run counting because that depended on the barometric altimeter, so it won't count those runs automatically. And the same goes for just simply using an altimeter that isn't there either. Uh, so keep in mind, those are all features that are removed. Likewise, while there is the muscle map feature in here that shows you this colorful diagram of where the different strength workouts uh, focus on from a muscle standpoint, they have removed the workout animations. That's something on the Venue 3 that we walk you through, a strength workout, 
sort of core workout type stuff uh, and show you how to do that movement correctly. Same is true for yoga as well. Now, on the bright side though, they did add some other sports features besides the profiles we talked about earlier on, and that's an on-device interval uh, workout feature. This allows you to create intervals on the device as opposed to having to push them from Garmin Connect. You can still download and iterate through structured workouts from Garmin Connect or third-party platforms on the Vivo Active 5, that's still there, but you can also create these manual intervals just on the fly without having to do anything on your phone. Likewise, when you finish a workout, you've got a new uh, workout benefit feature. This will show you basically the benefit of that workout, essentially telling you what the point of the workout is, sort of like a coach would tell you what the point of the workout is. And then after that, you'll get a new recovery time estimate. Uh, this is something you'll see at the end of every workout, but you'll also see if you swipe down to the bottom of your widgets, you'll see recovery there, recovery time, uh, and then what you should be doing, training as usual. Now, because this watch is so different than the Vivo Active 4 uh, from a display standpoint, and it's four years down the road from a Garmin perspective, let me just give you like a quick two minute tour of all these new features and a user interface perspective. Uh, this is your watch face there. You can of course customize that. Maybe I'll do a separate beginner's guide on this uh, watch here. Let me know if that's interesting and just drop a comment down the bottom there. Uh, but you can swipe down from there and these are the widget glances. So you can see, for example, steps and so on. You tap into steps and you see the steps for the day. Uh, there's a run I did right there and the rest of the day. And, and you can kind of go back from there and go down to different widgets and open them up to get more information about the different things. All of this is, of course, relatively similar to other Garmin watches in the market today. But if you're coming from that Vivo Active 4 in the past or any other Vivo Active device, uh, this might seem pretty new to you. Uh, now, if I go back here and I tap the upper right hand corner, uh, this is the sport button, but now it's divided into both sports and apps. In the past, these apps like wallet, music, flashlight, alarms, etc., would basically be the bottom of your sports list, which was just always kind of weird because they weren't sports. At least I don't normally make flashlight a sport, but you know, hey. Uh, meanwhile, on the left hand side here is activities. These are all your sport profiles. Uh, if you go down to the bottom, you can add more or see more sport profiles. This is a list of all the profiles on the device right here, so you can see them all in one shot. Uh, and I can add these ones in the bottom here uh, and bring them up to my favorites. Uh, so my favorites being the ones that are back up here at the top. Once I were to tap on one of these, it would open up that sport profile. Uh, and this is where I would wait for GPS signal as well as the heart rate lock and any sensors that I've connected. Uh, I can tap the bottom here to start a structure workout, intervals, training calendar, tweak my settings, live track, and so on from there. Uh, now going back to the home page, uh, there is a new feature which is to swipe from the right. So if I swipe from the right there, this is the recents menu. Uh, you can change what happens when you swipe from the right. Recents basically just drops into the different uh, widgets that I've opened up last. So you saw I open up steps last, recover before that, sleep coach, HRV, etc. Effectively just going backwards through my video right here. Uh, but I can also customize that to be the flashlight if I want to instead. Accessible either via the swipe to the right um, or accessible up here in the apps menu. One of those being this flashlight. Uh, because this bright AMOLED display, I've got basically three levels of uh, brightness that I can use right here, of uh, white light and then one level of red light. Uh, now here in this bright studio lighting, it's not gonna look that bright to you, but I promise in a dark room, this is more than enough uh, to find your way. The red light is what I primarily use because it's just easy to get around at night with that without blinding anyone else in the room. Uh, and the white light is also handy if you legitimately wanna illuminate something up. So it's a handy feature to have, and if you want, you can set that as your swipe right. So on the right hand side, go to settings, and then you change a shortcut there and you go on down into the flashlight option. Uh, now, if I back out of this, when I swipe right, I get the flashlight right there and I can increase brightness up to full brightness. Uh, I've done this by setting up the flashlight, but I find I often like accidentally swipe that in the middle of doing something else and then the flashlight's on and chaos ensues. So uh, I've just sort of kept it at the reasons menu for now. Now it's worthwhile noting that all editions of the Vivo Active 5 come with music built in as well as Garmin Pay. Uh, so on the music side, you can do offline music, that'd be Spotify, Deezer, Amazon Music. You can download it to the watch, go out for a run. You don't have your phone with you or anything like that. Just a pair of Bluetooth headphones connected to this and you can listen to your entire Spotify account, assuming you have a Spotify premium subscription. And then likewise on the Garmin Pay side, that's our contactless payments. So I can use this watch, I can put my Visa card on there and then tap to pay somewhere else. Uh, now, from here we got to dive into accuracy of the GPS and heart rate, but it's worthwhile noting that this has an updated GPS chipset in as well. Uh, it has a new multi-GNSS chipset, which means it has multiple GNSS types. That is not multi-band though, or dual frequency, which is like the holy grail typically of GPS accuracy. Still, one of the things that I kind of talk about a lot is I don't care what the chipset is in a GPS watch as long as it's accurate. How they get to accuracy doesn't really matter to me. I just want it to be accurate. Uh, and so keep that in mind as we look at these accuracy results because 
Uh, it's impressive. Yeah, I'm just looking at a couple different data sets here. Here's a long gun my wife did. Uh, and in this case, it was like two and a half or two hours, something like that. Uh, and you can see as you zoom in, the tracks are virtually identical to her multiband Phoenix 7 Pro. Uh, so you're talking a much higher end watch that's like three times the price. Uh, it's performing identically to the Vivo Active 5. So then I took it into a city test. And this test basically is simulated, not simulated, it's literally straight up 20 to 30 story buildings uh, and up and down these tiny little streets, just like in Manhattan or something like that. And you can see here, it did very, very good. Not like as good as the Garmin Epix, which is again, a thousand dollar watch, uh, but really close for not having multi-band. My wife then took it out on a four hour ride, uh, but she decided to do loops around this little park because she just wanted some consistency there. And it's impressive. She did something like 45 loops of this uh, cycling path uh, and the tracks are spot on that same portion of roadways the entire time. Then again, we went out yesterday for an open water swim. Here you can see the tracks uh, comparing to her Phoenix 7S Pro, uh, as well as the swim buoy and it's spot on there. Meanwhile, from a heart rate standpoint, here is a interval workout on the treadmill. Uh, very, very good. Just uh, one tiny little blip there at the beginning. Uh, then here is a long run for my wife uh, compared to her Phoenix 7S Pro. Uh, in this case, again, it's identical across the board. There's no differences there. Uh, here's a bunch of intervals I did in the city uh, compared to a chest strap. Uh, a couple minor bobbles, but very, very small bobbles only for a couple seconds. So that's pretty good. And then here is the heart rate from that outdoor ride, that four hour ride. I mean, astoundingly close to the chest strap as well as our Phoenix 7 Pro optical heart rate sensor. Overall, very solid on the accuracy front. Okay, so wrapping things up here, where does this watch stand? Well, I think I've got to look at it from two angles. The first angle over here is, as a watch, is it a good watch? Does it do what it says it's supposed to do? And does it do it well? Uh, and from that perspective, yeah, it does. Like the display is great, the battery life is solid, uh, the accuracy is generally pretty solid. Like across the board, all the new features work generally well. I might disagree with the sleep coach, but the nap pieces and just everything else in the watch Good job. It's basically, again, like a little mini Venue 3. Now, with all that said, I can't help be a little bit confused as to why this watch, well, exists. In Garmin's case, they have so many models and brands in their portfolio. And this is yet just another brand that, frankly, I thought was kind of dead. It's been four years since the last version. I thought, like, we were done with it. And that made it sense in my head because you had the Venue lineup and then last year's Venue lineup a little bit cheaper. And then you got the Forerunner lineup and the Epix lineup and the Phoenix and the Tactics and Instinct. And, I mean, there's so many watches. Uh, and... I understand why Garmin needs a watch at this price point. I really do. I totally agree. They need a watch at $299. Uh, and this does compete very well against the Apple Watch SE, competes against the Samsung Galaxy 6, uh, competes well against Fitbit's models, and it competes well against probably the Pixel Watch as well. So again, this is a great little watch. I've got no problems with this watch. I think it's, it did its job really, really well. I just think as a company, Garmin needs to like take a step back for a second and look at the portfolio of all their watch brands they have out there and realize that it's gotten insanely complex. Uh, not just from a brand standpoint, but all the features that are there and not there and so on. Uh, and even for me, this has got to the point where it's nearly impossible to figure out what each brand is supposed to be doing at this point uh, and how a consumer is supposed to make sense of all that. With that, if you found this video interesting or useful, go ahead and whack that like button there, hit subscribe, you know what to do. Have a good one.